We're going to talk about the gut brain connection, picky eating, um, why you might need to go dairy and gluten free and how to do that. Some tips on that special diets and gut issues. I was just talking about the vagus nerve, how it's a two way highway, two directional highway from the brain to the gut and the gut to the brain. And all my clients I've seen have inflammation in the gut and they have inflammation in the brain. So what is inflammation? It's really a helpful process. If you have a cut on your arm or skin, your knee, our, our immune system goes into action. We create inflammation, swelling, redness. This is all part of the healing process. So when your child has inflammation in the gut and inflammation in the brain, it's our immune system trying to heal. There are things that are getting in the way, like it's picture a cut in your brain. I mean, not literally a cut, but that same process is trying to occur. And what happens in chronic inflammation is we get stuck in that stage of that red inflamed, like, um, you know, kind of bad part of inflammation. Um, we want to move forward to the part where we actually get the healing. But what I find is there's things in the way. So there's toxins in the way. We find heavy metals. Um, we find um, the kids that I work with have a lot of chronic infections, and then those microbes keep producing toxins. We have pesticides and plastics, and this stuff is just all over the place. I talk about this all the time, um, so I'm not going to go in depth into that, but I just want to say these are inflammation con contributors to inflammation. These are the things that cause the inflammation in the gut. And when we have those things, those toxins, I'll just refer to them broadly as toxins, when we have those toxins in the gut, that invites the bad bacteria, the bad parasites, the yeast, probably a lot of your kids have, um, you know, you've gone to um, a practitioner, maybe your, maybe your pediatrician, you've worked on yeast and candida. Um, we have a lot of people more and more and more with mold illness. So we get fungi and mold can be in the body. Um, if it's in the house, it could come into the body through spores. So these all contribute to inflammation. And when we have an inflamed gut, guess what? It doesn't feel good to eat certain foods. It doesn't feel good. So if your child is a picky eater, maybe it hurts to eat. I had a client one time um, recently, I think she was, um, her mom did the GAPS diet, the gut and psychology syndrome diet. I think that's what GAPS stands for. And she um, started this diet and she started feeling good in her gut. And she told her mom that that was like, she didn't realize that pain in the gut was not a normal thing. So from the day she could realize, you know, feel her insides, she was in pain. And when she went on this special diet, she was like, wow, I don't have pain down there. And her mom didn't ever realize that that was her constant state. So I want you, as I'm saying these things, I want you to think back with your kids or think now what's going on. Does my child have an inflamed gut? Probably you're, if you're here, they probably do. And, and what can I do about that? So gluten is really inflammatory. And is it the gluten itself? Yes. Is it the stuff we spray on the wheat before we harvest? Yes. Um, you know, they spray Roundup on crops before harvest because that uh, desiccates or dries out the grain and it makes it easier for the tractors and the process to handle that, right? So if you have a bunch of sticky grass together, it's going to be harder to harvest than if you have dried out grass, right? And so they put this fresh load of, of herbicide and pesticide on our food and then they go ahead and process that and then use that as wheat. Also, our wheat is very, very hybridized to have high levels of gluten. So gluten is like glue, right? It's the stuff that sticks together. It helps your pasta stick together. Um, it helps your foods, you know, when you do breading on chicken, it helps that stick together. Uh, I was just in Europe and um, I was with a woman who had gluten sensitivity and she was able to actually eat gluten there because it's such a different type of gluten, it's such a different type of wheat and they don't use as many pesticides. So have these things kind of rolling through your head as I'm, as I'm talking about it, like, hmm, what am I feeding my child? Are they getting non-organic gluten, you know, wheat? Um, so gluten itself is very inflammatory. Dairy can be very inflammatory. 
The other issue with these two are that when um, that when they break down, right, we start digesting these big proteins and they break down into smaller proteins. And if they don't have, if they're not fully broken down and you just have all these little peptides, which are portions of proteins, so a peptide, 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 these peptides can leak through the gut, get into the blood system and get to the brain, right? Leaky gut, leaky brain, and um, they kind of go hand in hand. And these act like morphine-like substances. So if your child seems addicted to dairy, addicted to pasta, bread, cheese, um, you know, these everything that has wheat, pizza, um, these little chemicals act like morphine. What does morphine do? When we when someone's in the hospital getting morphine, it reduces our pain levels. It makes us feel good. So eating this stuff makes someone feel really good. It makes us want to eat more. It's a little bit addictive. And if you've ever tried to get your child off gluten and dairy and they get really angry or um or they just they can't handle it, some the whatever their behaviors are get worse, that's telling you that there's a little addiction going on there. And you know, what do we do with people who are addicted to things? We put them in detox units and clean their system out of the chemical. So you can do that cold turkey which probably is a hard thing, um, especially if you don't want, you know, chaos in your house for the next two or three days up to a week, um, or you can do it slowly. So one of the ways you can help your child come off gluten is to, let's say you're giving um, pasta, you know, some kind of spaghetti, you can start substituting, um, let's say you're doing 100% wheat pasta, you can start you know, with 90 or 80% wheat pasta and then put a brown rice pasta or quinoa pasta or some other form of pasta in there. And then you slowly, slowly, um, or maybe not so slowly. And then maybe the next day, next time it's 50, 50%. And the next time you have only 30% of the gluten and 70% of the other one. And I can just hear what maybe you're saying, oh, but my child will just eat the gluten one and, and pass on the other one. But this way you're getting them used to the new one. And eventually that's what you're going to give them. That's the only one. Um, it's harder with older kids for sure. I have a question from someone who emailed in and that I'll get to later. Um, but it's definitely harder to transition kids to a different diet when they're older, especially when they get to be around 12, 13, because they're in middle school, they have their friends. Um, they are out in the world and it's really hard to control what they eat. So if you can start your child younger and, and get them to be eating good food, good nutritious food when they're younger. Um, and I want to address right now, why does diet matter? Remember, I don't, I don't know, you, you guys probably aren't as old as I am, but you are what you eat was a saying, I think. I don't know, from my childhood, I remember it. You are what you eat. So think about what you eat. You know, are you eating chemicals? Are you eating, um, are you eating meats that have been raised with antibiotics, with um, growth hormones, with um, diseases? You know, I don't know if you guys know, but if you do a deep dive into the meat industry, into the poultry industry, the chickens. Um, you know, there was that egg shortage earlier this year because of a bird flu. Well, these birds are, are sitting next to each other, packed in, same with the cows, and they're given, given growth hormones. They're so big that they can't even walk around, not that they're allowed to. Um, same with the cows, they're giving so much hormones and, um, and the feed that they get is usually has like corn and soy from genetically modified crops. So you're feed, the GMOs. So you're feeding whoever's feeding these animals GMOs, they're pumping them with chemicals and then they kill them. Actually, they have to kill the animals early because they can't survive long. They get too sick. We're eating sick animal meat if you're not eating organic grass-fed, you know, animals that are treated humanely. So think about that. You are what you eat. You, your child is what your child eats. So I want you to get this picture in your head of like, wow, 
Do I want my child to eat grapes and strawberries and tomatoes and cucumbers and, you know, cabbage and spinach, or do I want them to eat this, all these chemicals? And I'll share with you a little bit later, uh, some of my best tips for removing the breakfast cereals, the sugary stuff, the processed stuff, those kinds of um, products that we see commercials flashed us at us all the time, Lucky Charms and I don't know, Captain Crunch. These are the ones I remember from my childhood, but they're still there. The Oreo cookie cereal. Like, first of all, Oreo cookie isn't healthy in and of itself. So why would you make a cereal out of it? It's not healthy. It's just a bunch of chemical junk. Pop-Tarts. I used to eat those all the time as a kid. Look, I grew up on junk food. Um, I mean, I had good food too, but we also had that crappy food because advertising and marketing is so influential and the kids want it. So the parents get it. Anyway, um, I'm going to show you how to ditch all that stuff and just have really healthy food. All right. Now, we talked a little bit about gluten, a little bit about dairy. I want to share how to transition. So some of these tips for transitioning won't work mm -hmm. if your child is sensitive to other foods like phenols, salicylates, oxalates. And these are all chemicals, natural chemicals that are found in foods that our kids can react to. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but first I want to do some switch outs. So Probably by now, 20 years ago, the gluten-free industry was almost non-existent. And now you can get almost anything gluten-free, bread, crackers, um, snacks, uh, you know, crunchy snacks, cookie cuts, salty snacks, sweet snacks. And what I want to say about that is the gluten-free substitutes are not always, um, they're not always healthy. Um, Luminara has a question yes. in Facebook. Um, how do you detox your kids by decaused by my um I'll get to that thing? later. Okay. I'll, I'll get to that. I, I always love talking about detox, so I'll get to that in, in a minute. Um who is that? Ashley. Ashley. Um <clears throat> so there are a lot of gluten-free substitute products and they're not necessarily healthy, any healthier. Um, they can contain corn flour, um, tapioca, or potato starch I see a lot. And potatoes are one of the most pesticided foods, one of the most sprayed foods. And so um, I don't like when products use potato starch unless it's organic. And it's really hard to find a gluten-free all organic substitute. But if you're cooking at home, if you're using things, you can use almond flour. Um, there's other alternative flours, but instead of regular flour, almond flour is a common one. Coconut flour, the consistencies of what you make are a little bit different. Um, instead of uh, breading your, and you can use that for breading your chicken or your fish or whatever you're making. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Yeah, I think almond flour is a good alternative and coconut flour is a good alternative. Instead of couscous, you can use quinoa. Instead of flour tortillas, you can get organic um, corn tortillas. And there's even, I've seen cauliflower wraps. So people are getting more creative. Um, there's different forms of pasta with quinoa, lentils, rice flour. Um, there's probably a couple other ones. Um, I've seen those at Trader Joe's and natural grocery stores, and I think they're becoming more and more common. Let me see what else. There's rice crackers. You can get organic rice crackers instead of wheat crackers. Um, I highly recommend you stop goldfish crackers if you guys are using those right now. I mean, it has food coloring, it has flavorings, and they're just, they're not healthy and they're gluten. Um, let's see. I'm looking at my list. And of course there's gluten-free bread. Let me see what else I want to tell you guys about that. Um, for milk, for dairy, you know, there's all kinds of coconut dairy, soy dairy. And of course not everyone's going to be, not everybody is going to like soy. 
Uh, so sometimes you need to go, go soy free, corn free. So besides gluten free and dairy free, like I've heard from parents, we went gluten free and it didn't do anything. That might not be all you have to do. You might have to go soy free, egg free, corn free. It depends if your child reacts to food. So here's how to tell. If after giving your child some food, they have a stomach ache, they have gas, they're um, pushing their stomach on the arm of the chair or the couch, you know, if they have red cheeks, red ears, if they have a behavior that's just crazy out of this world, anger, or aggression, silly laughter for no reason, these are all signs that what you're feeding is having an effect. And that you need to reconsider what to feed your child. And so I think you need to work with a practitioner, probably need to look at what are food sensitivities and there are food sensitivity tests to do. And you can look at elimination diet. So an elimination diet, most of your kids are probably on an elimination diet of their own choosing. Well, you just take out all the things that you think are offensive and you just start with white, white rice and, and then you build up from there and add more things in. One of the things I would recommend if your child isn't super rashy, eczema, histamine reactions, um, super allergy prone, bone broth is really great. Collagen. Um, so bone broth will give the necessary amino acids that um, are the building blocks for our proteins. So there, there's you don't have to do a lot of digestion. It's very um, broken down and it's kind of elemental um, nutrients. Um, so bone broth and collagen are both really great. I also, I'll just give you another tip. I also really love glycine. Glycine is an amino acid that's very common. So if your child is getting protein, beans, meat, it, glycine will be one of those amino acids that makes the protein in those food, in those items. And glycine is the simplest chemically, it's the simplest amino acid. It's in our collagen and our fascia. So all our connective tissue, think about what connects your bones, right? The ligaments, the tendons, what connects your joints, what your joints are made out of, um, your the tissue that holds in your organs. So all of this fascia connective tissue is made with collagen, our hair, our nails, our bones, they're all made with collagen. Collagen has a lot of glycine in it. So if your child is getting non-organic food, and like I talked about earlier, the wheat, peas, legumes, um, chickpeas, lentils, all these things that are sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest, glyphosate and glycine kind of compete for each other in the body, right? If your child doesn't have enough glycine in there, then um, then the body is like, oh, well, this, this thing looks like the next best thing. Let's put this into the protein. Let's put this into the connective tissue. Let's put this into the bone. And, so, and it's it's doesn't function the same way. And um, the tissues are weaker. So adding glycine is kind of the antidote. So if you have this much glyphosate and this much glycine, what's your body gonna take? It's gonna take the, the glyphosate because it's way more prevalent. But if you have, if you're like kind of loading your child's body with glycine, and I would say maybe a teaspoon a day, depending on age, older kids, I would give more, maybe two teaspoons a day. Um, and if you have more glycine and your body and your glyphosate levels down here and your body's like, I need to make this protein. Oh, good. All the, here's all my raw materials. I have a lot of these. I'll use this. So that's just one little tip. And that's what um, bone broth and the collagen has the glycine. So you don't have to add that as a separate amino acid. All right. I wanted to touch on um, some of the symptoms again for sensitivity. So I mentioned earlier salicylate phenols and oxalates, and I'll tell you some foods that are high in those and some foods that aren't. These are chemicals naturally occurring in food like almonds and spinach and berries, and our kids can be reactive to this. And I, I think it's not actually the food itself. It's our microbial environment in the gut. So if we have the right gut microbes, we won't be sensitive to this. But there are special diets to not have these foods in. So think about it. If, if our child's eating spinach, which is high in, in oxalates, um, and then the body reacts, right? Let's say they get red cheeks or they get red ears 
or they just get gassy and they feel crappy, or maybe they have joint pain, um, you know, so some pain in their body, if you can tell if they're having pain, right? Um, you would avoid spinach for a while or any other thing in oxalates, and you would use other foods instead. So what we want to do is reduce the things that are creating a problem and inflammation and the microbes to go, oh, yum, yum, yum. And those microbes produce horrible toxins that make us feel really bad or the oxalate can't get broken down. And so um, an oxalate, it, like it, it becomes a crystal. So imagine these little pointy crystals flowing around in your blood. And maybe you as a parent could experience this too. Um, if someone's had kidney stones, um, gout, this is oxalate that causes that. And they're like sharp little crystals and they hurt in the body. So we just need to reduce the oxalate load in that case. The red, I mentioned red cheeks and ears, hyperactivity, aggressive behavior after eating, laughing loud or inappropriately, um, being really impatient, not being able to wait, being very impulsive. These are all signs that your child's reacting to a food and possibly the salicylates, the phenols and the um, oxalates. Um, so what has salicylate? Salicylate is another chemical. It's actually an aspirin. It helps us, it helps to bring the pain down, but um, we can also be reacting to this. So fruits like berries and avocado, raisins, grapes, pineapple, plum, cantaloupe, cherries, and apricots, those are all high in salicylate. So think about what you feed your child. If and, and think about when you feed your child those things, do they react to those? Um, some veggies are broccoli, spinach, cucumber, squash, sweet potatoes, um, some nuts like pistachios, almonds, and Brazil nuts, some seeds, chia seeds, apple juice, orange juice, and a lot of spices. So think about that. Wow. Does my child react when I give them this? And think about this for the picky eaters. I, I think our body has a wisdom. So maybe the child who only eats five things could be addicted to the gluten and dairy, but maybe when they eat that, um, you know, cantaloupe or, you know, the berries, they feel really crappy. So they don't want to eat it. So think about that. Like, think about, start listening to your child's body signals. I'm sure you already do, but um, now you have a, um, like a little bit deeper level to look into when, when you're feeding um, them. So foods instead with that are low in salicylates, lemon, lime, mango, banana, pears, figs, pomegranates, passion fruit. Not like we all have access to all of those, but you might. Um, beans, peas, lentils, celery and cabbage, carrots, asparagus, beets, green beans, cauliflower, mushrooms. Those are all low in salicylates. Now, the hard thing is that if your child's sensitive to all of those salicylates, phenols, and oxalates, um, it's it, it really limit it really really narrows down the type of food. So I'm just going to go through the phenol high phenol foods, and you just take notes and write down what is you know what's the what's the thing you feed your child and what you notice and what's possible to feed them instead. Um. There's a preservative called BHA. It's in a lot of cereals and cookies and crackers, and that has phenol in it. So if your child reacts to these processed foods, um, different berries, blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, plums, apples, pomegranate, spinach, white beans, and black beans. Um, and then foods with oxalates, with really high oxalates, almonds, and peanuts. So if your child has nut allergies, think about that. Um, beets, buckwheat, wheat bran, oatmeal, brown rice, soy, uh, raspberries, citrus fruits, and spinach. So think about this, you know, if your child has food sensitivities, maybe it's, it, they're, they can't handle an oxalate. They can't handle the phenol. Um, and the foods to eat instead for oxalates are broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, cucumber, zucchini, mushrooms, most meats, most fruits. And you're probably going, man, my kid's not going to eat any cauliflower. What do you mean? So there are ways to make it that it's actually tasty and inviting um, to, <laughs> to eat or to at least try to give to your child. And 
I think with that, I want to go into some strategies for picky eaters. All right. We already talked about there's many reasons why your child might be a picky eater. So not all of this is going to work for every child. I'm really giving a broad paintbrush for every, you know, every kind of situation. Um, the thing that helps kids get more accustomed to food is to have more exposures to them. So when you're cooking, and I hope you're cooking, <laughs> and not just ripping off a piece of plastic from something and putting it in the microwave. Um, I know probably that's how some people grew up. Um, I grew up with my mom cooking from boxes and cans, and uh, we didn't have, I think microwave came out when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and that was a new hot thing, but I never liked it and I haven't used it in decades. So think about how you can not use microwave food and the plastics that come with that and just all the processing and the bad stuff that's in it, like the non-healthy things. There might be a few healthy ingredients, but then the rest is not very healthy. So I hope you're cooking. Um, have your kids help you, right? Right touch, hey, can you get that cauliflower out of the fridge for me? Can, will you grab that broccoli? Have them hand it to you. Have them, if they're able to work with a knife, have them help you chop. Have them, if they're not, have them put things in the bowl. Have them put it, you know, move food around in however you do your preparation. Um, I started having my son help me chop vegetables, which he was resistant to in the beginning. He might've been 11, 10, 11, 12. And I would have him start helping me cut and I would help him. Um, if you need, um, if you need resources on that, my colleague, Katie Kimball, a kids cook real food. She has taught all her kids how to cook food and she hasn't cooked in years. They do all the meals. <laughs> So consider this as a possibility with maybe not your child who doesn't have good, um, you know, motor control, but your other kids. All right. So prep, cut, taking them out of the fridge and then put it on their plate. That cauliflower you just cooked, put it on their plate and tell them if they don't want to eat it, they have a little plate up, you know, just next to their big plate. If you don't want to eat it, you have to take it off your plate and put it on the little plate. So they have it, they have to touch it. Um, have them touch it to their lips, have them touch their tongue. They don't have to eat it, right? Then have them take a bite and, and spit it out. So these are just gradual steps to help your child get more used to the food. And then also, um, I've been working with parents and they're like, my kid's such a picky eater. He'll only eat this and this and this. And then I later come to find out that the mom I've been working with is super picky and her, there's something off with her palate. And yeah, I never liked this and I never liked that. So, you know, we're our child's first teacher, demonstrate, show them it's okay. So, you know, you may need help expanding your palate too. And, and you just try things. And I think our palates change over time. And I have a feeling that's not just age related, but it's also related to our microbiome. So I think probiotics can do a lot here, but you want to get the right probiotics. So talk to your practitioner about what's the right one. Um, for your child, you might need to do some testing for that. Stop fast food, just period, just stop. No McDonald's, no Chick-fil-A, which is filled with um, MSG, no KFC, no Panera, no Olive Garden. Um, can you mute everybody? Um, make sure everyone's muted, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, just no fast food, cook at home. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned already the slow substitution method, right? So if I've talked to parents whose um, kids will only eat a certain brand of breaded chicken nuggets, so you, you gradually introduce your own type of um, breaded chicken nuggets that you know are healthy, you know you're using good oils, you know you're using gluten-free, and, um, and so you do half and half, and then you eventually switch it over completely. Um, and remember that you're, you know, there's, there is a little bit of mindset stuff that goes into this. You're the parent, you set the rules. It's, it's your job to set the rules and be the parent and not let your child, um, you know, run over that boundary. 
And I have talked to some kid, some parents whose kids will go on a hunger strike if they don't get the thing they want. Um, and that reminds me of, I did a blog on picky eating a while back and um, one man wrote me back and he said, do you know what? There's no picky eating in third world countries because they don't have enough food. The kids eat whatever they get. And he said, so I did this with my son. I said, you get this or you don't eat. And after three or four days, his, his, his son ate and he ate what he put in front of his plate. Now I would say that's like the hardcore kind of military way to do it. <laughs> and I don't know if we, you know, you have to have the muster to do that. You have to have the, the strength. Um, there are, you can probably ease into that. And then starting when your child is younger is a lot easier. And we have a, a question from, I, I think it might be uh, Sabrina um, that I'll get to later about her older son and how to transition him, you know, what to do. Okay. Um, so all of these things that I'm talking about, these food sensitivities, um, the gut inflammation, um, they're all creating these behaviors, right? That we see the hyperactivity, the inability to speak, um, the, you know, lack of eye contact, the inability to um, be social, right? When there's so much going on in the body, it picture like a busy city in the body. And mostly it's thugs, it's gangs, it's gang wars inside the gut, right? I'm going to give you these toxins. Well, I'm going to give you these toxins. And so there's these kind of wars going on. And with all this stuff going on internally, how can we possibly, how can a child possibly pay attention to what's going on on the outside? You know, I've seen kids pace, pace constantly. To me, this is a sign there is a lot of discomfort going on in the body and it feels better to move around all the time or they're compelled to move around. This is um, food, our food can be our nutrition or food can be our toxins, right? Food can feed the microbes that create the toxins. Um, constipation, diarrhea, alternating diarrhea, constipation, um, pushing on the abdomen, lots of gas. These are all signs again of inflammation and we need to balance what's going on in the gut. And I see that as we actually detoxify the kids, they start to eat more, things shift. So imagine in the brain, you have all these hurdles, these toxins, right? They're hurdles. You're trying to one nerve, one neuron is trying to send a signal to the next one, but it just, it just can't get through. And we have that happening like millions and millions of times, right? Billions maybe. And the messages aren't getting passed through because there's hurdles in the way. The more we pull those hurdles out, the more the communication happens and then these sensitivities, like the food sensitivity, the oral sensitivity, the uh, preference of crunchy, um, crunchy versus pureed food or soft food, that really goes down. I've also seen when we're taking the toxins out that kids who couldn't have the shower on their head, they couldn't have their hair clipped, you know, the sound of the, you know, hair scissors or the electric um, shaver thing. Uh, kids who they couldn't have their hair washed, they couldn't, um, or their face washed, they couldn't put their head under the water in the swimming pool. All this shifts because that sensory system, it seems like the hurdles are just being taken out. And, and then the behavior shift, right? We're just not as sensitive. Um, I, I wouldn't do this nutrition um, uh, talk justice unless I talked about parasites. So we talked about the bad microbes in the gut. We talked about the, the toxins that feed them, but parasites are kind of like the big mother trash bag in the gut. So a parasite will have the microbes in it. They'll mold will hide out in there. Lyme, if you're from the East coast, it's very prevalent, but it's all over the world. Actually, Lyme uh, microbes, um, mold, I said mold already, but um, yeast, and then heavy metals and plastics, the parasites like yum, this is a buffet for me, give me this. So it's like a big trash bag in the gut. And what happens, it it leaks out its, its stench, right? When you walk by New York City and there's like dumpsters loaded with, um, with garbage bags, you know, out in the street, it smells horrible, right? All that stuff's leaching out. So that's what's happening in the gut. And that creates the behaviors. And if your child's constipated, that stuff isn't getting out, guess where it's going? 
throughout the rest of the body into the brain and it just keeps recirculating. So you've got a waste system that isn't actually getting rid of waste. It's just recirculating all the waste. And we find when we pull this waste out, then then you're actually starting to clear the waste. So picture muddy water, right? And when it settles and then the mud's on the bottom, it's not out of the, it's not out of the puddle yet, but it's on the bottom. Then you see the clear water on the top. And that that's kind of the brain clearing of toxins. It's an analogy to the, when we pull the toxins out, then we have clarity. And I want to get back to your question. Um, let me find it. Amy, how do you detox your kid's body? Wow. Um, so that's a big question. And it's not a simple answer. Um, because what happens when our bodies, do, so we all, I just want to say, we all have the capability to detoxify. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. Okay. All of our bodies are detoxing all the time. Every single cell has this capability. A lot of it happens in the liver. So take your right hand put it over the bottom of your right ribs, kind of like I'm doing here, just put it over the bottom of your ribs. That's your liver, right? Your hand is covering your liver. So that does most of the detoxification. Um, I think there's a lot going on in the brain too. And what do we need to detoxify? Well, we need good genes. We need um, the enzymes to detoxify. And a lot of times we have toxins sitting on those enzymes. So our, it's a picture of factory that, you know, we're missing parts or there's, there's a bunch of dust and, you know, threads and um, just debris that's gotten in the way of the gears turning. They're not going to turn, right? So maybe your factory only has 50% output. And this is what I see with kids on the spectrum. I'll see three kids in a family. And let's say the third one has the autism symptoms. They're not the good, they're not a good detoxifier. Why? Well, partly the genetics they, they got and partly um, you know, our overload of toxins. And what happens is those toxins sit on the detox machinery and then it, it, it tamps it down even more. What helps with that is to pull the toxins out. So the first step that I use to pull toxins out is to make sure your child is pooping. Constipation is not okay. We have, um, we have different types of poop and I want to explain what constipation is, if you don't know, because some people think it's normal to have a child pooping every three days. Some pediatricians think it's normal. Oh, don't worry if they're pooping every two or three days. That's normal. It is kind of normal these days, but it's not the natural state. What we need to do is have our kids pooping one to four times a day. It has to look like a smooth snake or a log. If it's cracked and dry, if it's little pellets, if it's um, really hard to pass, if you see that your child isn't really fully emptying, that's constipation. There are things going on in the gut that aren't allowing every all the waste to get out and it's being recirculated. So in our, um, in our Transforming Autism Jumpstart program, we have, and maybe Carmi, you could put a link to just more information about that in the chat. And um, Louise, if you want to put that in the Facebook group, that would be awesome. Um, that's our, our page that explains what the Transforming Autism Jumpstart program is. What we do is we tackle constipation and opening up the colon. So that's one of the first steps in detoxification. We need to make sure the waste is going out every day. Um, part of that is binding up the toxins. So here's what happens in our, in our bodies, in everybody. We take in food, we digest, hopefully we're digesting well, it goes through the stomach, the small intestine, and then it goes into the liver to nutrients, make a lot of things. The liver does a lot. Um, and then it goes into the large intestine and as it goes through, it's being compacted into what comes out as our poop, right? Our stool. Why, why does it get compacted like that? Or, or what's the mechanism? What happens? Our body has this amazing, amazing uh, capability to absorb water, to, it, to keep a water balance going. So we will absorb water from the colon. Our body actually sucks it out. And that water 
goes to do other things in the body. Why is this important? Because if we have toxins in that water, they're going to get reabsorbed right back into the body. But if we have binders, if we have little catcher's mitts in, in the colon that are holding these and the water gets sucked out, they're not going to get sucked out into the rest of the body. So binders are super important. That's activated charcoal. That's biotoxin binder. That's GI detox. Um, that's apple pectin. So these are some of the binders that uh, we use. And these can be incredible for making sure the toxins actually go out in the stool. Now, that said, activated charcoal is pretty binding itself. It'll grab, it's very promiscuous. It'll grab most, um, it'll grab vitamins and minerals and medications and most everything. And it's, it'll grab water, it's very binding. So if your child is already constipated, activated charcoal isn't the best one. We use biotoxin binder. Um, and that's been miraculous for so many, in so many ways that I won't go into right now. But the, my, my key point there is you asked Ashley, how do you detox your child? You start by binding the toxins and making sure they get out of the body. And then you, you, you know, the brain is full of toxins, right? It, where are they going? They, if, if, if you've got toxins here in your neck and toxins in your organs and toxins in your connective tissue, it's like a toll booth on the freeway, right? In the old days when you had to stop and pay money, it's like a traffic accident. Everything else is backed up. So if you've got a bunch of toxins here and they're not draining and they're not coming out and they're not going down, this is the back of the traffic jam. You're not going to empty the brain. So you have to detoxify in the right order, in the right way. And that's what our program's all about. It's it's starting with the colon and then we work our way up the body because you know we detox from the bottom up. And if you do it the wrong way, if you do things in the wrong order, if you just try to go, oh, I'm gonna do some heavy metal detox right now, you can really cause problems because the body's not equipped to do it that way. Um, it needs to drain out from the bottom up. Um, what else do I want to say about that? I've, I've seen, I've seen parents, here's some ways I've seen this fail detoxification. Um, I've seen parents go to biomedical doctors or people who want to give a lot of supplements and muscle tests for supplements which is awesome. I love that because our kids are nutrient deficient and we need those nutrients. Um, but if there's a lot, if you're chock full of toxins, it's really hard for the nutrients to get in the body and it requires energy to get them in. And our kids are mostly low energy. And when I say energy, I, I, I can hear, no, my kid's hyperactive. That's not what I mean. I mean, energy source within the body. We have mitochondria inside the cells that make energy. And if, if it's not producing enough energy for the cells to do the right thing, we're not going to pull those nutrients in. So sometimes there's detox nutrients or detox herbs or detox, um, you know, chemicals we want to use. If, if they're not getting in, they're not being useful. If they're getting in and just moving things around, and then let's say you move a toxin from this part of the brain down to over to the back of the brain, you're maybe going to exacerbate or make the behaviors worse. And so, um, if you're, if you're not opening up the whole body first, before you start moving toxins, then you can really cause problems and serious problems, right? So picture your house, picture a hoarder's house, right? There's all kinds of things in the house. There's just hardly any space to walk. And you try and bring groceries in and try and get to the fridge and try and put them away. It's going to be hard, right? This is like us trying to put, um, vitamins and, and minerals into our child's body and it's it it can't accept them. The other thing is imagine that hoarder's house and you want to clean it out, like you're going to sell it and it has to look really nice. You can't take all that stuff out of the house in a day. You can't it might take you months to take that stuff out of the house and clean it, right? Our bodies are similar. We we can't just say, okay, toxins be gone and they're gone. It's a process. Um, part of that process is making sure our gut's working right. Part of that process is, is making sure our drainage systems are open. That's like the pipes of our body that drain our toxins out. 
right? We need clear pathways out to take the toxins out or else we're just going to create more issues. So that that's to answer your question. Um, I want to get to a couple other questions that people ask me in email. Okay. This is from Sheila. Address gluten and dairy free. She's into Weston A. Price. This is the, I mentioned this way earlier, the um, GAPS diet. Um, Weston A. Price was a dentist in the 1920s who realized that people's teeth degenerate as, as we have more and more Western diet food. Okay, so she's into Weston A. Price and they are all about raw dairy in all forms, but my daughter has respiratory issues, so I'm not sure if they're safe for her. Um, I would I would try and avoid dairy. And you can do an experiment, um, Sheila. Do an experiment. And this is for everybody. Take your kids off dairy and gluten for two weeks. It, do your best, do the best you can to really be completely free and then add it back in and see what happens. So that's for you, Sheila, you know, take her off the dairy because those, um, those dairy proteins can really do a number on our respiratory tract and make us very mucousy. Uh, so do that experiment, take her off and then put her back on and see what happens. And then you'll know whether to do it or not. Also with gluten is einkorn flour. Okay. So einkorn flour is a very ancient grain. It's I talked about our wheat being very hybridized and um, einkorn is like kind of before it got very hybridized. So einkorn flour could be okay. Again, try that experiment um, with taking her off all of gluten. Um, oh, given her gluten sensitivity, it's hard to get her to eat most veggies. So any tips are appreciated. Oh, you know what? I forgot to give my tips. Let me go back. Um, So we talked about the sensitivities. I forgot my best breakfast secrets. Okay. Um, and that plays in your question, Sheila. So focus on high protein and good fats, avocado, bacon, turkey, hamburger, veggies cooked in olive oil. And you're like, what? Those aren't breakfast foods. Yes, they are. Stop giving my tip number two is stop giving processed food, sweet stuff like the Pop-Tarts and the cereal and the waffles and pancakes. It's not giving nutrition to your child. It's giving them carbs. It's feeding the microbes in their gut. Um, it's feeding the yeast. And especially if you put sugar and jam and berries and like all kinds of sugary stuff all over it. And, and there are alternatives. We don't have to get ourselves into, oh, I have to have sweet in the morning. If you have, if you give your child protein and fat, it's going to sustain their brain for a much longer time because it breaks down slower in our bodies. If you give them high carbs in another hour or two, guess what they're going to need? More high carbs because their blood sugar went up with all those carbs and then insulin's produced and that takes all the blood sugar, you know, the, the sugar back into the cells. And then we have a low blood sugar. So we can have this seesaw high, high blood sugar, low blood sugar. So if your kids get a uh, low glycemic or like, um, like they're gonna, you know, th there's a lot of symptoms for, um, low blood sugar. There's getting angry, right? Like they really need food and they need it now or a hangry. <laughs> Um, there's, I, I remember once as a kid, I almost fainted and I, you just feel really bad. So if you're giving sweets in the morning, you can have that seesaw effect all day. Start with protein and fat. Um, you can make like chia or flax pudding. Um, there's recipes for that online. And I would put also, this is great for laxative. If you put like an eighth or a quarter, sorry, a tablespoon of chia seeds in an eighth or a quarter cup of water, just in a small dish. And you let that sit for like, say 10 or 15 minutes. It gets really goopy. Um, it's a great laxative. And then you can add that to your dairy-free yogurt, your oatmeal, your berries, your fruit, whatever you're, you're going to give. So that was my tip number three chia or flax pudding, which is also laxative, has laxative qualities. And make a high protein smoothie. You can use banana, nut butter if your child has nuts. Um, avocado is really great to put in there. 
berries, collagen, or bone broth. Um, there's a brand from there, there's brands out there that are, you know, good tasting or chocolate or vanilla. It's a great place to hide supplements, but if you're going to put supplements in the smoothie, um, take about two tablespoons, two or three tablespoons of the smoothie out, put it, put it in a glass. So you just have a small amount and put the supplements in there. So you're sure your child takes all the supplements. If you put them in the whole smoothie and your child only eats uh, drinks a quarter or half of it, they're not getting all the supplements. And here's a tip for the smoothies, add lettuce. Lettuce is tasteless. It's full of water. It's full of fiber. And it's also, you know, it's got some laxative qualities, right? All that fiber. And if you're going to make pancakes, I've talked to parents who've made pancakes with um, almond flour. We talked about that, but chicken and veggie puree. So you can put cauliflower in there, cooked cauliflower. Um, and it's, you, you mix it in a blender and then you put that in with your pancake mix. I'm sure you can find recipes online. I don't have any handy for you right now. But these are ideas of putting veggies and meat into the pancakes. So your child's still getting the pancake, but it's a savory one, right? And it's gluten-free. All right, those are my breakfast tips. I really wanted to give those. It was many, many years ago that I started um, to realize, wow, I don't need to eat this sweet stuff. I don't need to eat gluten in the morning. I don't need to eat grains in the morning. And so I just stopped that all together and your body really gets used to it. And that, that high fat and that high protein really helps just get you through the day. <laughs> all right. So let's go back to Sheila. Did we answer her questions? Tips on eating veggies. So puree. So one other tip on eating and getting veggies into your kids is soup. I used to do this for my son. I used to make him chicken soup when he was a baby and I would just make a regular chicken soup and put tons of vegetables in it. And then I would puree it. I just had this hand blender. I would puree it. And so there you have it. It's, it was, you know, you can drink it for kids who don't want to eat that pureed stuff. This is drinkable. All right. All right. So we have a question about older kids going gluten-free, dairy-free when he was younger, there was no progress. So, um, again, you might've needed to do some other eliminations and, or do some gut health stuff, some getting rid of some parasites and microbes. And my guess is you probably did that. I think this is from, this is from, sorry, I, I don't think I put the name on who this is from. Sabrina, maybe. Okay. My son is big and aggressive. And it's not an exaggeration to say that he can be very aggressive, even as a result of not getting his requested food and drink. So this, this tells me, is there an addiction thing going on? And you might want to try that method of, um, if he has a hundred percent milk, go down to 80% cow milk, 20% almond milk, for example. Um, and, and slowly, you know, reverse those percentages. Um, she tries to introduce nutritious, good foods, but afraid to restrict other ones. So I would say keep doing the nutritious ones and less and less of the other ones. Um, he's aggressive and self injurious. And, and you know what, for you, Sabrina, I, I really feel like you, this is parasite related. I really feel like you need to get the parasites out too, the microbes. You, you need to, parasites and microbes are there because we have toxins there. So this is really a, a perfect detox case, right? And it's harder to get older kids to take supplements, but if you can get him to, then that's what I would do. Um, grandson is on the spectrum, diagnosed as being anemic. Do you have tips on multivitamins with iron or foods that are high in iron that he may like? So for you, Sue, um, being anemic can probably be an imbalance of gut flora as well. So I would say you want to look at a good probiotic and work on his gut. And I would work with your practitioner to do that or have your, whoever your daughter or your son, whosoever kid it is, work on that. Um, there are some supplements, but you know, with iron, you can overdo it. You can give the wrong form. So I really would say check with your practitioner 
because I think this could be very specific to the child and you want to probably do a blood workup on that and get more information on that. And it sounds like they, they do have a blood workup. So if you're not seeing a practitioner who knows about food and iron and like the right supplements, then you should see someone who does. Um, it's really hard to do that, not knowing it to, for me to tell you, not knowing any other information. Um, there are foods that are high in iron. Um, I, again, I hesitate to tell you, oh yeah, just put more iron in. Um, and I hesitate to, to be, I, I'm not, I don't have confidence that he'll be able to pull that out of his food. And it's probably, that's probably a gut microbiome issue more than anything else. Um, let's see. All right. This is Sabrina again. Is it a good strategy? Oh, this is Carmen. Is it a good strategy to hide healthy stuff in his safe foods? I'm afraid he will notice and stop eating this. You know what, Carmen, this has happened. So what I would do is, um, you know, do some of this tips and strategies that I talked about today. And I would take a portion of his safe food and put, put the good food in, right? Or, or I would do it slowly, right? Like, let's say I'm, I'm just taking a wild example. Let's say you're giving him a smoothie and you want to start putting um, broccoli in it. I mean, I wouldn't recommend this. This is a weird example, but um, that's going to give it a certain taste, right? So when you first are going to put broccoli in it, but let me give you an, an example a pediatrician friend of mine did. This is a much better example. She said to her kids, how about if we have milkshakes for breakfast? And they are like, yeah, milkshakes. And she at first had milk and ice cream and she slowly changed it to almond milk and not ice cream. Um, I can't remember the substitute she did. Maybe it was frozen berries or frozen bananas, I think it was. So she gradually... Um, increase the good stuff, you know, maybe 5%, 10%, 20%. So do it at your child's like taste rate. And so you gradually uh, supplant or, um, or replace those foods that he, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going on a different question. Um, you gradually add, maybe you don't want to take out the, the other stuff he's doing. I'm sorry. Um, but you want to add the good stuff. You add it at tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. And if he tastes it at that level, he's a super taster. So you want to back off, but eventually um, you have more and more of it. And at some point he might go, yeah, I'm not having this anymore. And you go, okay, well, let's have a different one. So you also have to like, there's a psychology about it too. Sorry, I st start answering kind of two questions in my head at the same time. So that's how I would get the safe stuff in uh, the healthy stuff in his safe foods. And, you know, and here's something that I think we all can do better as parents. And I really tried to do with my son, who's now 25. So I don't have to deal with his eating issues. Um, we can have like, be honest with our kids. Look, this is healthy. Your body needs things in here and I want you to eat it. And, and, you know, we're going to try and eat more things like this. And I'm going to put it on your plate every day. And like, I think we should talk to our kids as if they're really understanding everything we're saying, because I, I suspect they are, and they may not like it, but you're the parent and you're going to put it on their plate and you want them to eat it. And I don't think we always need to be sneaky and tricky. I think sometimes just honesty and transparency and come from your heart when you say that, not like you're going to eat this food, but like wow, I really care about you and love you. And I think this is going to help your body. So I want you to try this, you know, approach it with this energy of like generosity and love and caring. And I think you might be surprised that the energy says more than your words. And maybe you found this, right? Like, so these are just little psychology tips, energy tips, you know, how to approach your child. You're still the boss. You want them to do things. It's out of love and care. Uh, you approach it with kindness. And I think that 
that can really be a good strategy. Um, let me just check and see if there's any other questions that anyone wants to ask. Are we? Look at the chat. Mm. What if a child, oops, <laughs> disappeared. What if a child also has seizures? Do they need a keto diet? Yes, Jamie, I would definitely look into a keto diet. And I really feel like seizures are parasite related. So cleaning out the body is huge. Um, what would you recommend for kids that don't chew? Smoothies, um, blended soups. Um, all right. Uh, Sabrina, he will take supplements, no problem. And I bought BioRay Primary Detox. Would this be okay place to start? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. So I'm not sure what's included in that. Um, let's see, he can swallow capsules if you have a better one. So I, I just don't know what's included in that. So, um, and I don't have time to look it up right now. And oh my gosh, we've gone over our hour. I thought this was going to be really short. <laughs> so I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined either on Zoom or on our Facebook Live. And please definitely um, let me look and see if there's any comments. Yeah. Whoops. What is the comment? Hang on. Um, I'm not seeing comments on my page on the Facebook Live. Louise, are you seeing any? Um, maybe I need to refresh. So anyway, if you have more questions, that's a place to post them in our Shifting Autism Behaviors Facebook group. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed and we'll have a replay out and it'll always be in our Facebook group. So you can go back and refer to that because I, I ended up covering a lot and I went through a lot of lists and a lot of behaviors and a lot of tips. So hope you all enjoyed that. Thanks for attending.